today I would like to focus on lesson three, which is building objects from scratch. When we did lesson two, we they had the little we had the little sunflower exercise where they already created the parts for us and we just moved them around. But again, before I start this, anything you want me to cover to review. It seems pretty good. You getting the hang of this program? Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me, but I have to refer to the book for the dimensions. Um, I've done this, I have to look and see what we're doing. So this is what it's supposed to look like, to look like when it's done. So really, the, the focus of this exercise is the pencil itself. And that's what we're going to build from the get go. And it's using a series of basic tools, which you'll find here. If you want, you can tear these off. Rectangle, rectangle with radial corners. Um, don't use the ellipse. But we do use the polygon tool. So really those three in order to make this. And I would rather that you watch me and ask me to redo things as many times as I need to because there is a very there are efficient ways of doing this by using keystrokes. Um, and I think it will make for a more efficient way of building your objects if you can begin to work this way and it will be more accurate too. So I'm going to reduce this a little bit in size and put it over to the, anybody remember the keystroke for allowing me to shift to the hand real quick? Quick zoom in and zoom out. The zoom in will be now plus and the zoom out. Okay, there you go. Those are very helpful. Just those three different piece books. I'm going to create a new one. Pencil. Let's see. And I get the same line on the rest of them. Actually, I want this to be vertical. So, notice I made a mistake. It's horizontal. Not a big deal. Just go to file, document setup, and then switch from horizontal to vertical. Okay. Still letter size. Yes. You know, one with this. One of the things. So we have a blank sheet of paper. We're ready to make, design the logo. The logos, by nature, tend to be fairly accurate. You know, it's accurately measured and put together. You know, it's not loose like a sketch. So in order to be accurate, you need rulers. You need guidelines. You need. Um, possibly a grid to help you align things and to measure them properly, right? That's how. So the first thing that I like to do is to bring up rulers. And I like that to do that in Photoshop too, because remember that tells me, that reminding me what size I'm working on, because you can zoom in and zoom out, and you can think, my gosh, I'm working on this thing that's this big, and really, you're working on something that's this big. You've just been zoomed, you know, you've zoomed in and can be a little um, unruly when you print it out and you discover it's only this bit, especially for So <clears throat> you bring up rulers, that's a view menu item, and you can say show rulers from here, or similar to Photoshop, it's command R, R for rulers. So that's something you'll probably want to memorize. Now, 
it does something that I don't particularly like. Um, that it measures from the left one over, and that it measures from the top 11 down. And I prefer the corner right now of my paper to be zero, zero. Well, we can change that. We can move and slide the rulers around. So watch, and this is how you do that. And you can do this in Photoshop, too. So you move the cursor in the upper left-hand corner here. You see where my mouse is right here? Like it's, oh. Okay. It's probably off the, right here. It's just to the left and just to the top of the rulers. So you move in here, <coughs> and as soon as you click, you see the crosshairs. And now I drag the crosshairs here. And wherever I release the, the mouse will be where I have zero, zero. You see the little lines moving around? So I want to move it over the corner. And I release, and now it's zero, zero. Okay? So it makes for measuring much easier than leaving the default settings. Another thing that we can do to help us, as I mentioned that there is a grid available. So again, that also, because that's a visible, that would be found under the view menu. And we can come down here and it will say, show grid. Command quotes is the keystroke. I don't use the grid that often, so I don't memorize, I don't know this memorize. But you can memorize all of these more power to And just like you would have grid paper that maybe you'd use for math or for whatever you know, other classes in the past, you have a little grid that lays on top of this pretty nifty. So now we have pretty nice brains with the measurement. And one last thing that I would like to add here that I don't see that is a menu item for a palette is if I go to the window, what I would like is the transform menu. And I don't remember whether the book wants it up here or not, but I like this. Because as I'm building an object, it tells me the X and Y coordinate of the center. It also gives me the width and the height in inches. And if I wish to rotate or skew, I can do that from here as well. I showed you the other day, well, we can use the rotate tool. That's one way of rotating. Well, as I said, there's always at least three or four different ways of doing things. So, <clears throat> let's start by building our pencil. And pencils are hexagon, six-sided, right, right apart two six-sided. Oh, no, that's a round piece. Mm -hmm. Six sided. There are six sides. Six or five. Mm -hmm. I think they're octagons. What? <laughs> it is hexagon. Well, we're making ours are octagons. <laughs> Okay, you know, so what we're going to do is we're going to make, if you look at this, we're going to start by building the pencil itself, just a rectangle. And we can always rotate it later, we can always colorize it later, we can always change things later. It's easier to start vertically, make your, your object, group it, and then move it and change it any way you want. Okay, so let me set this aside. And I know that it's supposed to be one inch tall by three quarters wide. So I can pick any place on my piece of paper now, select the rectangle tool, and I'm going to use the default settings for stroke and fill. Um, fill is white, stroke is black. And we can always change those later. I'll move over here and work on the grid here. And if I want, I can also snap to. If you like that, you can say snap to grid, snap to point. 
and that too can be useful to help you make the measurements um, accurate. I'm just going to get it in the ballpark here. And I'll click and drag, and as I move it, and this may be hard for you to see, but look at the rulers as I move this. You see a little dotted line at the top moving back and forth? And when I move the mouse like this on the left hand side, you see a little dotted line moving up and down. So that tells you where you are. It tells you, you know, if I look at the ruler, it's three quarters of, a, of an inch wide. It is one inch tall. And now I can release. And when I release, it looks pretty darn accurate, doesn't it? But now look over here into my transform panel. That's why I like this. Because if you're really going to be fastidious and particular about your measurements, look at how accurately this thing measures. This measures to, let's see, it's 10, 100, 10 thousandths, 100 thousandths of an inch. That's accurate. So to change that, all I have to do is click in here and replace the last digits with a 5. So I have 0 0.75. Hit the tab key, and you don't really see it change here, but it does change. So it is exactly, when I mean exactly, it is exactly three quarters of an inch. Likewise, the length I thought was an inch, but it's five thousandths of an inch. So now I can go ahead and I can just lock that off and then hit the tab key, and now it's exactly, exactly, exactly. If I wish to move, whoops, I didn't want to do that. No, I'm going to go back to the arrow tool. Go back to the arrow tool, and if I wish to move it around, I can use my, I can either click or drag, or I can use the arrow tools on my keyboard to nudge it up, nudge it down, and nudge it left or right. So I've made the first rectangle for my pencil. Now we're going to make the plane that you see here. And this is the tricky part. It starts to get too tricky. It, I don't. Maybe it is, maybe it is. I don't know. It's just it's using keystrokes and it's thinking about how you create objects a little differently. Because typically when you create an object, you just click and drag, and by moving your mouse diagonally, you make a rectangle. That's one way of doing it. Okay. And. I could have started with a random size like this, and I could come back up here, and I could type in the exact size that I need, and then I'm done with it. That's a pretty efficient way to work, too. Now what I want to do, though, is I want to make a concentric rectangle, because that's what this is. I want this to share the same center as this one, to be the same height, but be narrower. So how do you do that and be really, really accurate? Um, what I like to do is I'm going to zoom in so I can see this constantly. And that's a real advantage, um, especially when you're like me, don't see so well. You know, um, you can really see this like looking for a magnifying glass. And now what I want to do is I want to find the center of this. To do that, I go to view. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to add smart guides. Now when I move the mouse over the edge, notice that you see the little highlight. And when I move over the middle, you see where it shows the middle line in light blue? So I can see exactly where the center is, where the mathematical center of this rectangle is. Because I can, if I select it, I can see the center because it shows it to me right here but I don't want it selected. So I just want to move over the center. And now I want to make the concentric rectangle. So how do I do that? Because if I click and drag, it's going to go diagonally. And I'm going to guess where I want this. And if there's no guarantee, it's going to be in the middle. So I'm going to make a rectangle, but I'm going to use a little bit different method now. By holding down the Option or Alt key, instead of making the rectangle diagonal, it will make it from the center out. 
So by clicking in the center here, I'm going down to option field. Oops, I move it and I make a copy, and that's not what I want to do because I have the wrong piece or the tool. I want that. So. Sorry about that. Put an option key. Make sure that you have the, the rectangle tool selected. When I click and I drag, and notice how it makes it from the center. And when you move over the edge, it highlights, so you know that that's where you stop. The width, however, is arbitrary. It's what looks right in this particular instance. We're not concerned about that. You see how it highlights when you move over? So you know it's exactly the same, and it shares the same center. Voila. Deselect and look at that. It matches perfectly. So now we're ready to move on. We have our, the, the pencil, or, um, the wood portion selected here. Now we're going to make the eraser. For you to create the eraser, we'll use the appropriate tool. It'll be a rounded rectangle. Okay. Okay. Now I want the radius of the corners to be a specific radius. If I simply click and drag on this, it gives you the default settings for the radius. And the radius for the corners may be too much, it may be too little. <clears throat> if you do not need an exact amount or, or radius, if you're just going to do it visually, then click and drag. And then before you release the mouse, use the up key, and that makes it rounder. Click the down key, and that makes the radius small. Are you still holding the mouse down that yes. whole time? Yeah. It's while you're creating it. Once you release the mouse, it doesn't work. You have to start over again. Everybody got that? Let me do that again. You click and drag. Before you release the mouse, you use your up key to make it rounder, you use your down key to reduce the radius. But I don't know <clears throat> what the radius is. What if uh, somebody gave me specific um, numbers that I had to plug in? And if I had to be accurate like I was to what, 10 thousandths of an inch? Um, then what I would do is the following. And I've got to find the uh, mm -hmm. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hold down the option and then select around it, the corner for the rectangle with rounded corners. I'm going to hold down the option key and click. Okay. So you have the tool selected, hold down the option slash alt key and just click. When you click, it brings up a dialog box. Now what I can do is I can specify the width and the height, and I can specify the corner radius in here so it can be precise. And I mean precise. So I want the width and the height to be 3 quarters of an inch, so I type in 0 0.75, 0 0.75, and I want the radius to be 0.2. Now I click OK, and there it is. Now I can simply use the selection tool and move it in place. And then once again, maybe use my arrow keys to measure. So now we're ready to make the, the the metal bands that go around the pole that, you, that attach the eraser to the wood. <clears throat> and it's a similar procedure. So again, I have to look at the measurements here, 0.85 and 0.10. OK, so I'm going to do this pretty much the same thing. <clears throat> Make sure that the rectangle tool with radius is selected. Pull down the option key, click. Now I want 0.85. That's the width. 
height, what did I say? The one. Point one. So it's, it's not very big. It's a tenth of an inch. And then the quarter radius, I'm like really, really small. And point oh five, five hundredths of an inch. Oh, that makes it for me. And once again, I'm going to move the place. Now, how do you make a duplicate? hit Command C for copy, and then Command V for paste, or you can go edit, copy, and then when you're done, you hit paste, and you will get another copy. A better way to work that is to hold down the Option key, Alt key, while that shape is selected, and then with the Selection tool selected, click and drag, and then to constrain, because this can slide left to right, hold down the shift key, and that locks it in place. You'll feel it snap. So now when I move it up or down, it's like it's on rails. It's only moving it vertically. I cannot, when I, when I move it to the side, you'll feel it, see how it jerks to one side or another? So that you know it is in place. And I move it in place, and I have not released the mouse yet. Now I get it in place, I release, and now I have a copy. So when you want to make a quick duplicate of an object, select the object, hold down the option or slash alt key, and then click and drag, release the mouse, and then you've made a copy. If you wish to constrain the direction, whether that of the movement, whether that be vertical, horizontal, or a 45 degree angle, then you also hold down the shift key as well. And then, if you, again, if you wish to make this in place, just use your arrow keys. And look at how quickly this is going and how accurate it is. But part of that requires using just those little key, those key commands that I'm suggesting that you do. Because it can be done just you know, visually and try to guess and nudge it, and, but you'll be fiddling with it for a long time, and it probably still won't be as accurate as what we've done so far. <clears throat> Next part is a little tricky. Um, you'll notice that I'm going to use the polygon tool, and we need the point at the end of the pencil now, and when I click and I drag, what do I get? I get a hexagon. Well, that's not a triangle, but that's okay, because we use the same tool to make a triangle. So to do that, I move over the center, like I did before, because I want the width of this to match this. So let's move over the center, and I click and I drag until the center is matched. And now to make my triangle, I hit the down key. Now I have a triangle. It's the same way. Now to constrain the direction. Oh, I didn't want to do that. Oh, I broke it. Oh, this could go more. Looks like I wasn't on the 
To move it down, I go down the space bar and the shift key and spring it to push. And I might have to move it one way or another. So it's a space bar I move it. I blew it. <coughs> and that looks pretty good. Now what we need to do, <coughs> let me do that one again. Well then, here's another one if you want, because what we want to do is we want to make the red to the pencil. So how do we make a little mini version of this triangle that fits in the lower right, in the, in the lower part of it? It's exactly where we want. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to make sure that this is selected. I'm going to select the scale tool, which can be found right here. And I want it to scale from this point right here. So I, I want it to scale from the center. I want it to scale from this point. So what I'm going to do now, if I just click here and I move it, it scales that. That's not what I want because when I release it, I have the point, but I no longer have the, rest. the pencil part. If I just wanted to scale it, and I didn't want a copy of it, then I could leave it that way. So what I want to do instead now is I want to hold down the Option key, and then to bring up the dialog box, similar to what I used to bring up the dialog box for the eraser, I move over to the point right where I want it to reduce, and I click, and now it brings up the the dialog box. I want it to be uniform scaling. It doesn't have to be. <clears throat> but I hit 30% and now I click preview. And that's what I want. <clears throat> but I don't click OK or I get the same results as I had before. Instead, what I do is I click copy. And boom, now I have two. One exactly. Notice how much more efficient that is in trying to make another one and then try to layer them on top of one another and hope that they match. This one matches perfectly. So pretty much that's it, except for now coming back and if we bring up our color palette, we bring up our color palette, we can change the colors. One of the things that I would do too, since I see this as a group, you know, a single entity. <coughs> I mean, even though the pencil is comprised of parts, I see it as a whole. So what I might do, so that I don't accidentally move them and resize them, or do anything that I would have to go back and remake, is select them all and group them. And what key stroke do I use to group them? And, and it looks the same when you do that. Now when I select one part, the whole thing is selected. If I wish to modify one of the parts, what tool do I need to use? Not direct. I guess you could, but what is a better way to do it? Group selection tool. So now I can come back and I can put one of these. And if I need to nudge it, change it, I can. So if you're going to color it, you would need to use that group selection tool to color each part. To select way. each one, right? Select each part. But, well, having said that, yeah, you, you, you can all, yeah, yeah. That's 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 but you could also colorize it first, and then you could wait when you're done, and now, move it. but because everything is in Apple Pie or Um, 
want to show you how to make the star. I know how to make the star, but there are different kinds of stars. There are five point stars, six multi. And similar to the way we change the radius here, the way I change the size of the polygon, we can do the same with these others. And I'm going to make the little cut a little bit differently than the book calls. I'll show you a different way of approaching this. One of the tools that is extremely useful in Illustrator is the Pathfinder tool. And it's not discussed much, and I don't know why. I find it an incredibly powerful tool. So let's start with these easy ones here. So if I want to make a little five-pointed star, I'll click on it. What can I drag and I drag it? So if I want one with more or fewer points, click and drag. And again, before you release, unless it's the size is really important, hit the up key and it adds points. And down key removes points. And if you want to change the, the radius, um, meaning where these inner points lie relative to the outer points, then you do need to hit the option key and click. And you'll notice that you have radius 1 and radius 2. So if I want a really, you know, lots of points, and I want, let's make this, let's make this one, Let's make this 0.25. Just, I'm just guessing. Here. Can you see how different it looks? How close these inner points are to the center, and how far away these points are? It's different than this. Look at the ratio from inner to outer, so you can control it. But you have to get the option key and click that tool in order to get it. So there's lots and lots of controls in here. So you make what you do very precise. You don't have to be precise in everything you do, but you know, maybe your style of illustration or the way you draw is, is more loose or looser. <clears throat> but as I mentioned um, earlier this week, that that's what this program was really designed to do, to take the place of a, of a drawing of a traditional <coughs> drafting tools and skills. Okay, so we're going to, I'm going to make the little cup now. Um, it can be done in a variety of ways. If I'm going to use this vertical line is my center line for my perspective tool. I can't, you know, for my ellipse, I can. But if I click and I drag, remember, it makes from the corner outward. But if I hold down option key, it creates it from the center. And I can sort of nudge it over a tab and down. Okay? And now that's my top ellipse, and now I need to make a bottom ellipse. So what's a quick way of duplicating that? To just use the selection tool, move it, hold down the option key, and release. Now, in true perspective, the bottom ellipse would be wider than the top ellipse. So all I have to do is click and drag and pull this down just a little bit so it's a little bit wider. Now I want to make the sides. And what I can do for that is I can click and drag, and I can move over. So you notice that it shows me where the anchor point is. I can click and drag. And when I reach the top one, you notice that it also shows me where the anchor point is. It's a very light blue. And now I can really so that they match. <coughs> Now what I want to do is I want to combine the bottom ellipse with the rectangle. Everybody with me? I want to join them together. 
So what I'll do is I'll hold down the shift key, and then we'll go back to the selection tool, hold down the shift key so that both of these are selected. And I need to go to Window, Select Pathfinder, and make sure that that's visible. This is really important tool. And I will talk about more later in the later weeks. But you can see that there's different shape modes that I can combine the two. I can subtract the, four, the, the shape in the front from the shape behind it. Um, I can overlap shapes and I can leave just the part that's overlapped. I can also do just the reverse. I can overlap shapes and whatever part is overlapped is re removed from that shape. I want to combine the two. Also, there are these features down here. This is a very nice one um, to divide. And I have, um, I will show you some Linda videos later on on this feature, um, which will be really, really helpful. And you can be really accurate and build it. It's a complicated video, but it's worth watching just to get a sense of a more effective approach to doing really complex illustrations. Well, I want to combine these two, so I just click Combine, and notice it combines them. Now, this is still, when I look in the layers, <coughs> this is considered a compound path. If I wish to release this, I can, and I can return it to the two shapes. So if you're a little unsure about yourself, about what you want to do, it's a compound path, it's a temporary solution, and they can be released back to their former self. But in this case, I'm pretty sure that I want to combine these two. So what I'm going to do is click Expand, and now it's permanent. And now notice, you combine this ellipse with that rectangle perfect. One final thing that I need to do, because every time you create a new shape, it's layered on top of the past, or the last one, I need to bring the top ellipse to the foreground. I can either do that in layers by just clicking and dragging and moving it up, or I can go to Object Arrange, and I can say bring the front, and it brings it to the front of everything. Now it's on top. And I really don't need to get rid of the back of the, the, the rectangle. I could combine these together, but it's really unnecessary. And now I have my cup. And I might want to combine these together. And then what you can do is you can colorize them. Um, I will, yes, go ahead. Is there another way of making a cylinder like that? Um, I forgot. Another way, I think the book does it slightly differently than I do. Maybe. Yeah, it does. And I think it's a less efficient way. So which one's like better technique. Well, what they do, oftentimes I look at what the book does and I go, why did they do it? And then I forget because that doesn't make any sense. Because that, that seems easier than what the book was showing. Much. Yeah. Way easier. Because the book makes you like cut the top thing in yeah. half and drag it down. Yeah. yeah. I don't know why. Adobe has always overlooked the Pathfinder tool. It's barely mentioned. And it's such a powerful tool. It's one that I normally, when I set up my palettes over here, that it's a, it's it's there. It's a dominant tool to keep in mind. Yeah, but I think that would be an easier way from okay. to work. Much. Yeah. Um, now to um, to fill and stroke or to change, just select them individually. That's probably the easiest thing to do. So use the group selection tool. And I need to bring up, uh, let's go to window. What do I need to bring up? Where are the My swatches go. Okay. And you'll notice that they have some swatches here that we can use. Um, let's see. They're not quite the same, but that's okay. So I'll select that one on um, the eraser. And in order to change the fill in the stroke, 
we just need to make sure here, let me pull this tab off, that if I want to change the fill, that the fill that this box is in the foreground by clicking on Can you move it over a little more to the screen? Because it's now, yeah. Make sure that the fill box is in the foreground. And then select, make sure that you select the shape that you want. Oops, I have it over there. And now put the color that you want. And it's not quite the right color. It's okay. If you wish to change the stroke or you want to eliminate the stroke, then make it in the foreground. And then you'll click none. Or I like, I forget what we did. We leave the stroke there. So we'll just leave the stroke there. So I'll go back, make sure it's in the foreground, put black, put it the black. And do the same for the other, you know, the other shapes. That I want this shape to be black. Um, I'm going to leave the stroke, make sure that the fill is in the foreground, put black. Put the background color here. Um, this is going to be sort of an orange, we'll make it a dark orange. And I can, we can change that too. If you wanted to, we could pick a different color from here. See how it might move up. And then we can select the top color. And we can, again, put, and maybe lighten that up a as well too. There you have it. It's like going to Denny's and getting a menu with uh, crayons and coloring. Okay. Anything you want me to review? Anything you want me to review? Could you redo that uh, one where you're making the whole object? I lost you when you started using the Pathfinder. I didn't know which one you selected. Oh, okay. So I, yeah, let me just make it a little bit. Okay. Okay. So let's start with the ellipse. And I want to use one of these guidelines for my center axis for my ellipse so that they're aligned. You know, like the, and I want to create the ellipse from the center out rather than diagonally. So to do that, I hold down the option key, I click on a drag, and it makes the ellipse. So. And I'm going to use the grid also as a guide. If you want, you, know, you can always snap the grid, and that's not a bad idea too. I'm going to go back to the default. Anytime you want to go back to the default settings for the colors, this little box in the lower left hand corner, default fill and stroke, click that, and it will take you back. And that's true in Photoshop. Too. And this one will flip. So the fill now will be black and the top one will be white. <coughs> okay. Now, to copy this, what I want to do is select, use the selection tool. Again, click and drag, hold down the option key and the shift key. The option key allows me to make a copy on the fly. The shift key forces it to stay in the slide along my center axis, this rail. And then I release the mouse first. Then if I wish to change the, the ellipse a little bit, I can like so just by pulling it down. So it's a little wider. Now I'm ready to add a rectangle. And by having smart guides on, notice what it does. When I go over that anchor point, it tells me I'm on top of the anchor point, which is useful. So that when I click and I drag, I know that it matches that anchor point on that side. And then when I move up here, I'm on, I believe I'm on anchor point here. I have a hard time seeing this. So I'm on anchor point. 
and now I can release. And now I know that matches. And you can also, you know, if it doesn't quite match, and if I had it snapped to grid or snapped to whatever I you know you want to see. Now to use the Pathfinder tool, I want to combine these two. So to combine them, I hold down and make sure that I have the selection tool, and I make sure that I have both the bottom ellipse and the rectangle selected. It doesn't matter which is on top and which is on bottom. Okay, so they're both selected. Now I can click on this button, it allows me to combine, and it will add them together. And to finalize it, as I said, right now, by doing this, it makes a compound path. Because if I want, I can always go back to object, where it says compound back, path. Um, oh, shoot. Let me go back. I can release this. I thought I could do it from there. Here's my compound. Here's a compound path. Let's just select. Down here, this that's quickly back. I know I can release it. I'm forgetting something at the moment. But in any event, what I wanted to do here is I wanted to expand and make it permanent. So by clicking that, now it is a permanent chip. And then I want to bring this one to the foreground. So this time I will take this shape and just move it above. So now it's on the top. Okay. Much better than the book. So whenever I can think of little things like that, I will do my best to add little tidbits. How do you pull that on top? Uh, I will put it on top. You can move either from here, object, you have to select the object, and then you can go object arrange. If you bring the front, it brings it to the very top of that layer. You can also send it back, which sends it to the back of that layer. When you select send, uh, send backward or bring forward, it moves it one step at a time. On the other hand, if you would rather to move it from here, um, what we can do here and here is I can click here and I can drag it up and down and notice how that little bar moves. You see how it's behind that? So you can move them up and down manually as well. What's undo? Remember the key command? Um, it is your friend. Man Z. Don't panic. Remember that. If you want, you can do. Um, it, it's not absolutely necessary. I think it's kind of sort of fun, though. Because this really looks like the direction that Illustrator is headed. Um, we, tomorrow or next Tuesday, and next Tuesday probably, will be focusing on the pen tool. And that was really the core of this program. In order to understand this program, you had to know the pen tool. And that's not necessarily the case anymore. <clears throat> um, this will be a little added thing. I'm going to go ahead and turn off the video camera because it's not that critical because I will cover it again.